All right, thank you, Dr. Mullinex. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to be here to um, to talk with you guys about um, one of the topics that I think is is extremely important um, in the beef cattle industry, and it's the next generation of cattle, which should be our best generation each and every year. Um, so today I wanna to talk with you um, about goals for developing beef replacement heifers on forages. So in Alabama, um, we have uh, the great fortune um, to have lots of rainfall, um, which gives us lots of forages. Um, so sometimes we get more than what we can use. Um, so it kind of gets away from us sometimes. Um, and then other times, uh, maybe we don't have as much as we would like. Um, so kind of trying to think about um, our developing our heifers in a beef system um, that uh, will work and be sustainable, uh, maybe even cost effective over time. Um, so kind of a brief outline um, is we're gonna look at some developing options uh, and then look at some nutritional management when it comes to cool season annuals and perennials, as well as summer perennials and summer annuals. Um, here in Alabama, we, we are very different when, it, when you look across the state. Um, so some of us have uh, some options that maybe some others don't. Um, then we're gonna, you can't talk about heifer development without talking a little bit about the reproduction aspect, uh, some of the breeding goals, um, and then one area that I think sometimes we as cattle producers fail our heifers is the rebreeding aspect. Um, it's almost like once we get them through that heifer development phase, uh, we decide that it's time to kick them out with the, with the mature cows and then uh, start pulling their own weight. Um, but it may be that we need to kind of revisit that and, and look at some, um, some rebreeding goals and knowing that those girls are not completely uh, grown by the time they calve with that first calf. So we may need to look at that. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. So um, just pulling a few um, um, quotes out of some papers. Um, heifer development, when you think of heifer development, um, you're selecting and developing beef heifers to replace cold cows, or maybe you're in a herd building phase um, where um, maybe you're building your herd numbers. Um, and that impacts the economics of a cow-calf operation through genetics and longevity. So improved genetics can enhance growth performance and carcass value, um, while eventual longevity of the heifer as a mature cow is influenced by reproductive success during that first breeding season. So when you think about the, especially the economics associated with, um, you won't have her to sell as a product that year, um, so she's not going to be in with the, the truckload of calves. Um, and you're investing in her potential performance in the future. Um, so when you're designing your heifer development program, and that's one thing that I think we miss sometimes is this needs to really be a written plan. It needs to be uh, something that, that you and, and whoever else makes decisions uh, on your farm. Um, this is not a time... Uh, while you're working cattle, um, that you you look and you decide, oh, she's pretty, I'm going to keep her. Um, these are some real quantitative things that you've outlined that are goals that you and the other folks that are, that are farming with you have decided upon. Um, so you have those those things in mind, and, and maybe it's the heifers that you know, were born earlier in the calving season or are from productive cows in your herd. Um, but then you need to list the needed supplies. And I put supplies in quotes because it kind of depends on what your farm looks like. So you need to list the needed supplies ahead of time and decide how feasible is it for you to develop heifers on your farm. Do you have the land area for it? Uh, they need to be separated from the, from the mature herd. They have different nutritional needs. They're in a growing phase um, rather than a either lactating or maintenance phase. So when you think about the feasibility, do you have the labor uh, that will be needed to uh, work these heifers and, and develop them? Do you have, again, the land space? Do you have the fencing? They, they a lot of times are a little more promiscuous and they like to try to uh, get in with the other cow herds. So do you have fencing that will allow 
uh, these girls to be separated from from maybe your main herd or the neighbor's herd bull. Um, so can you uh, make sure that they are isolated from, from the others? Um, and then two, do you have facilities um, when it comes time for, for vaccination programs and health um, programs? Do you have the facilities needed to, to work these girls appropriately and, and without really stressing them out? Um, so do you have adequate shade and, and do you have a good water supply? So these are all things to kind of think about um, when you start deciding to, to either develop your own heifers or maybe have someone else uh, develop them for you, or maybe you have a good system where you can purchase heifers. Um, so those are, those are all things that need to be uh, in your mind when you're thinking about it. So um, some of the traditional recommendations that you've heard in the past um, are that we want to manage our heifers to reach 65% of their mature body weight at breeding in order to maximize that pregnancy rate. This is still the recommend, recommendation today um, from our Alabama Beef Systems Group. Um, we, we see enough uh, local data uh, to still support that 65% of mature body weight. Um, in the past couple of years, there's been some studies that um, have released data showing heifers that can be developed as low as 48 and 50% of their mature body weight. Um, they show no negative impacts on pregnancy rates. A lot of that data is coming um, out of the, the Western states. Um, but when you kind of start looking through some of that, uh, those systems, um, they're they're restricting some of the gain on those heifers to a, to a 0.75 pound per day of gain. Um, and then they really utilize that, um, that ramping up or compensatory gain right at breeding. Um, so they increase that gain period at the time of breeding to get kind of a flushing effect um, to help with those con uh, conception rates. Um, so we need to do a little more work here locally, um, you know, to support that type of um, that 48 to 50 percent of mature body weight for us locally. So at this time, we still um, we still like to say 65 percent of mature weight. Um, and so in talking a little more about those development options, so when you think about ways to um, get them from that weaning weight uh, up to uh, the breeding weight, which typically we're trying to put about 200 to 250 pounds of gain from the time that we wean to the time that we breed. So there's a couple of options um, as far as uh, how to get to that end point. Um, so you may, um, probably the one that I like the best is the steady growing, um, the middle line that you see, um, kind of that steady rate of gain all the way up uh, to the time of breeding. But there are some instances where um, maybe your forages are better at certain times and um, sometimes you can't control the, um, the rate of gain that you may be getting um, with the forages that you have available. Um, so it may be that, that you have that really, um, really good forage availability and quality early in your, in your time frame. And so you get that really uh, high rate of growth um, and then it kind of steadies out there toward the end. Um, that would probably be my least favorite because if you're going to have a, um, a steady rate of gain, I would like to see it right before breeding. Um, so, so bringing them up kind of slow and then ramping them up would probably be the more desired um, when it comes to um, those top and bottom lines, uh, with the middle one being more ideal um, to get them kind of steady across the board. So when you think about your development options, so on your farm or in, in your availability, what forages are available from the time you wean until the time you breed? So if you have a calving season where you're calving in the fall or maybe you're calving in the winter or the spring, um, then think about when you're weaning your calves. So from the point of weaning to the point of breeding, what forages do you have available on your farm that you could put these heifers out on? Is it forages that you could plant uh, and have available? Or do you have some perennial forages 
um, that, that could be made available for these heifers at that time. Um, so will the forages I have available meet or exceed nutritional requirements of growing heifers? This may require you to test uh, some of your forages um, and, and see where, where they are at, at certain times of the year uh, and, and see if you could maintain those forages in that vegetative state to know that we can get the quality that we need. So then once you get those numbers, then you know if you have to supplement. So if supplementation is needed, you kind of need to know that on the front end so that you can have those commodities purchased um, on the front end. So all of this comes at, at a cost. Anytime that you're adding supplement, you're adding cost, you're adding labor, you're adding time. So the other thing is a lot of commodities uh, can be purchased at maybe in a time of the year where they're cheaper. Um, so if you can if you can get a price break on on bulk commodities and that's an option for you, that's something you'd want to take advantage of. So would supplementation be efficient and affordable for you? Um, so that's something that you certainly need to think about when you're thinking about the forages that are available on your farm. So this is a a slide that kind of looks at when certain grasses are are growing and available to us. Uh, here in Alabama. Um, so we know um, kind of looking at forage growth distribution um, versus calving season. Um, if, you're, if you're fall calving, um, thinking about when you um, might wean those calves, um, say um, in the next spring, uh, you would be looking at maybe the kind of the tail end of some of your cool season forages. Um, and then the beginning part of some of your warm season forages, um, which um, makes for some pretty good quality um, of grasses during those times. Um, so, but if you're, you know, say you're winter calving and you would be um, weaning those calves, say sometime in, in September, October, um, you know, then you're looking at kind of a cool season grass type program for those, for those heifers in that development phase. Um, so kind of thinking about maybe what types of forages are available to you and, and what you might be able to do there. So some nutrient requirements, goals. Um, a good goal that, that we uh, use as a benchmark is kind of that um, the one to day um, gain with 1.5 kind of being the average there until breeding to achieve that 65% of mature weight. So you, you need to look at them um, at a, um, at weaning, um, get an idea of, of um, maybe a projected mature weight, and you can do that using their frame score, um, and then get an idea of where they need to be um, as far as growth rate. So can it be achieved by pasture alone? And I think we've, we've talked about, you know, it kind of depends on your season. Um, so you can supplement your grass um, with maybe some cool or, or warm season annuals, some legumes. Um, if you need to add quality or, or add quantity, um, those are things that you kind of need to, to think about before weaning. So average quality pasture and hay always requires supplementation. So if you're at that average or even below average, and we've had some, some rough years of hay production over the last couple of years, it seems like we, we get rain all at once or none at all. Um, so some of our forages have been pretty mature when they've been harvested, you know, making some of that quality um, maybe less than desirable. So if you are supplementing with hay or if you have pastures that got kind of overly mature, um, you may have to go in um, on pastures and, and bush hog or kind of uh, restart that vegetative state. Um, and then keep in mind some of our, um, summer forages, um, when you get kind of into that July and August time frame, some of those forages have gotten pretty mature and headed out. Um, and two, it is just so miserably hot that it's challenging to get uh, heifers or really any animal out and, and actual, actually start grazing or, or any time grazing because it's, it's just hot. Uh, so they're, they're utilizing shade and um, spending that time loafing rather than, than grazing. So that, that July, August time frame can be kind of a challenge for, for any system 
So that's something that you kind of want to keep in mind when you're thinking about um, your, your system. So this is a table pulled out of the uh, NRC uh, looking at nutrient requirements for growing heifers. And this was um, just, to, just to give you an idea, um, you can look up um, kind of a mature weight target. Um, you, you need to weigh some of your mature cows. There's a couple of ways of doing that. Maybe if you're taking some cool cows to the market, jot down what those weights were and kind of get an idea in your mind of, of, of how those um, appeared to you. If maybe you thought they were 200 pounds heavier or 200 pounds lighter, it gives you a pretty good idea of where you may be uh, on your mature weight of your cow herd. Um, and then too, if you have scales, um, it's a good idea to, to weigh those cows. Um, weaning is a good time for that um, so that you can, you can see if, if she's producing 50% of her weight in her weaned calf, that's a good production uh, benchmark for her. Um, so this just kind of shows the age and months, um, 7, 14, or 24. And then the dry matter intake or the pounds of dry matter that 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 calf is going to be taken in and then the TDN or the energy component and then the crude protein component. So these are the, um, the requirements for growing heifers that you're trying to maintain at a two uh, pound of day uh, growing rate. Um, so this just some, some ideas of where those forages need to be. And then if they're not there, uh, how you may have to supplement. So I always like doing a little cowboy math because, um, I was always that student that needed uh, things shown to me rather than told to me. So um, if you have a group of heifers um, and say they wean at 500 pounds and they have an expected mature body weight of, of 1,200 pounds, so your target at breeding is about 750 pounds. So that means that you're going to need to, they're going to need to gain 250 pounds from weeding, weaning to breeding. So how much time is that? Um, so if you're weaning them at say seven months as an average, um, and then your age of br at breeding is 15 months, the difference in that is about eight months. So you have eight months to put on 250 pounds. So thinking about that amount of time and that amount of gain needed, um, your target is that one to one and a half pounds a day. Uh, of day gain. So if you're needing to um, put 250 pounds on in eight months, um, you can do that uh, with a pound a day. Um, so that one to one and a half pound of gain per day is a good target for you to have that steady rate of gain. So the nutrient requirement um, for one pound of, of gain a day, which is on the lower side, um, is TDN of 52.7 and crude protein of eight. Um, most of our forages um, can get to that. Now, when they get overly mature, that's when you're going to see these, these numbers start dropping. Um, but most of the forages that we grow, um, especially our cool season forages, they're going to really exceed these numbers. Um, so the question is, can I do this with forages? I think the answer is definitely yes. I think it's an option for us. Um, I don't, I think we can do this without supplementation a lot of times. Um, we have systems that, that we're working with that the main reason we supplement sometimes is just so that they remain docile. Um, and, and there is certainly something to that. Um, you do want them um, to remember who you are and what people are. Uh, there's a docility um, part of heifer development. Um, so, um, this, the next few slides that we're going to kind of go through are looking at a project that we have um, either at the Sand Mountain Experiment Station or down at the Black Belt Research um, Extension Center. So, um, the Sand Mountain um, Elite Heifer Development Program is, is done from January until uh, around June um, each year. And we've been doing that um, this next year will be our fifth year in that program. Um, so looking at um, kind of some real data from, from, from Alabama or from, from our projects, um, when you think about cool season forages for us, uh, you think about the, the perennials are going to be um, a fescue-based system. Um, and then and some of the annuals that we utilize, we utilize a lot of ryegrass or some ryegrass legume mixtures. 
and then the small grain mixtures, um, kind of your your wheat, your rye. Um, so those are going to be some of the small grain mixtures that we've utilized. Um, so this is um, data from just this this last year, um, and each year uh, seems to to have some challenges or uh, look a little different. Um, but this last winter was actually a pretty good growing season for us. And looking at the number of grazing days for each of these uh, systems, oh, and I will say I, I, I pulled the fescue data from 2018 um, because uh, we had to redo some, some fescue paddocks. Um, so the, the fescue data is from 18. Um, so um, the, when you start looking at number of grazing days, uh, and that's what you kind of have to think about um, when you're thinking about uh, developing on, on forages is how many days can I have them out there? Um, when you got 132 in the small grain mixture, um, 143 for fescue and 201 for ryegrass, um, the ryegrass, depending on when you have to start and stop grazing, can almost take care of a lot of your um, forage needs uh, over, that, um, over that growing period. And the one thing I'll say about the small grains, um, they, we can usually get on them about um, you know, 30 days prior to uh, say the, the ryegrass um, or the fescue. So it, it comes up earlier. So it gives us an option for that. And we also can graze it out. And so we can just continue to keep coming back to that. Um, and that's why it has a higher utilization is because we um, will continue to graze it um, because we can kind of graze it out um, before we move on to the to the ryegrass and the fescue mixtures. Um, so um, forage consumed, you know, per heifer per day, um, we're at that um, 9, 12, and 19 values. And we were looking at somewhere around, um, um, you know, 14 on our dry matter intake uh, earlier. So some of these numbers could certainly achieve those. Um, so quite a bit of forage available um, through that system. Some of us in North Alabama and over in the Black Belt have the option of stockpiling uh, maybe some fall fescue, most of which is uh, Kentucky 31 fescue. And I think we all understand at this point some of the implications or toxicities associated with that. Um, but we still have those forages available. Um, so this is a study out of North Carolina State um, where they looked at um, a, a late November through mid-January uh, grazing replacement heifers. Um, and so they were able to get some, uh, some pretty good uh, quality numbers out of that fescue. So 16 um, to 13% on the crude protein and uh, 68 to 60% on the TDN. Um, that would do pretty well for what we would want to achieve. So unsupplemented, so only grass, they were able to achieve that one pound of gain per day. And then when they supplemented at seven pounds of, um, per day of high energy feed, they were able to bump that up to, to 1.7 pounds per day and add a, a half of a percent of body condition score. Um, so um, certainly an option for us. Some of the warm season forages that we think about, um, we have bahia grass and Bermuda grass. Sometimes I think bahia grass is overlooked because it's, it's always been so readily available. Um, we, we've certainly used Bermuda grass because of its yield potential um, for, for hay production. Um, but bahia grass is certainly uh, something to look at because of its sustainability through some of our droughts. Uh, it's a deep-rooted perennial forage that kind of hangs in there with us. Um, so um, I think um, bahia grass is something that we certainly don't need to forget. Um, it has some really good quality numbers early on in the summer especially. Uh, so you could achieve you know, that one pound of, uh, of gain a day uh, on heifers using what what you have. Um, so some of the other systems, um, Bermuda grass, uh, native warm season grasses. Uh, this is, uh, we have a, um, a study going on at the Black Belt Station, um, kind of looking at um, replacement heifers on native warm season grasses. We're in our second year of that study. Um, so gains anywhere from 0.75 to one and a half have been shown in the literature. Um, you know, we're hanging out at that 0.7 up to a pound a gain uh, is kind of where we've been seeing. So supplementation may be um, needed with this with this particular program. We don't have everything put together yet, um, but um, it's certainly a tool in the toolbox, and it's maybe an alternative system to what we've had in place. 
Um, so when you look at those kind of average days of grazing per year on some of our warm season forages, you know, we're going to be in that 70 to 100, um, maybe 120 days of grazing on these summer systems. And we do have some overlap um, when it comes to cool season and warm season forages. Um, and then thinking about the yield on the different ones, um, you know, some are going to produce uh, quicker. So you have to have to understand that that maybe in a 30 day grazing period, you may have to do some, some put and take where you put more on um, and pull some off as that grass um, is growing. And we always use that rule of thumb of take half, leave half when we're talking about grazing systems. Um, so um, that project that I was talking about in the black belt, we're looking at alternative systems to tall fescue um, in summer um, for heifer development. Uh, so some of the numbers that, that we've been seeing, uh, this is just data from last year. We have, we're still collecting data this year. So we're looking at um, tall fescue compared to Bahia grass, um, which is in the middle there, or the native warm season grass, which is on the top. Um, so when we put those heifers on, um, you can see their initial weights and their final weights. And so we were kind of at that 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 pound of, of gain a day. So with this system, you know, with all of them last year, they, they would have required supplementation to get them to that pound a day um, and get them to that achievable um, desired weight at breeding. Um, so all of these heifers actually um, made it to, to breeding um, and had some really good conception rates when it came to total conception. Um, so we were able to, to get them to where they needed to be, um, but you kind of have to pay attention to them um, if you're using some of these summer forage systems. So um, at Sand Mountain, um, we've, um, when you look at grazing days across the years, this is something that you kind of have to, to think about there. Year two was the 2016 drought. Uh, and they spent a lot of time eating hay and supplement because uh, we just simply did not have any forages come up. Um, we didn't get rain up here from, from July till December. So planting in September, October um, for your cool seasons to be there uh, in January and February wasn't an option for us. So, so that really reduced our grazing days. Um, other than that, we've had, you know, anywhere from 138 to 154 days, 105 days um, on these uh, cool season annuals uh, with some, some perennial fescue mixed in. Um, so looking across those years, um, we've had some initial weights from 600 to uh, up to 741 pounds with breeding weights being from 790 uh, up to 882. Uh, and each year our gains have been about where we would like them to be. Um, you know, we're targeting that 1.5 um, and we've been from 1.6 uh, up to 1.86 this last year um, with total conception rates uh, being from 74 to 88. Um, these numbers we would like to see a little higher but when you're bringing in heifers from lots of different places with different management styles and a little bit of different age, um, this, this may be some, um, some good goals that we have here. Um, so looking across kind of a, a four year comparison, this is kind of a busy chart, um, but I think it, um, I think it further illustrates um, how uh, using forages um, is certainly uh, a good way to develop heifers. Um, when you look at um, gains that we were able to achieve uh, across the years, um, I think um, this is all doable. Um, depending on the weather, you may have to um, you may have to have some supplementation. Um, just as a kind of a descriptive um, data point, looking at frame score, uh, anywhere from 5.2 to 6.4. Um, so the, with the five being kind of the moderate. Um, and six frame score getting up there uh, where you're starting to see some 13 and 1400 pound um, mature weights. Um, so uh, on the projected mature weights, anywhere from 1190 up to 1340. Um, with the percent of body weight at breeding, um, you know, we were above that 65% each year, uh, which was the target for us. Um, and 
the rest of that data just is, is more on the genetic side. But as part of the development program, we want to sh be able to uh, give back some carcass quality data. Um, and I think that's certainly a, a portion of heifer development that you want to consider um, is, especially if you're uh, selling any local raised meat, uh, these are some, some numbers that you can show to folks especially that intramuscular fat um, to show um, maybe a snapshot into what their product may be. So just to, to dive into the economics just a little bit, um, I didn't summarize across all years, um, but I pulled from this last year uh, looking at um, what does it cost? So, so what does it cost to, uh, to do this system? So we had um, let me back up and see here. We had 26 heifers this last year. So <clears throat> we had a, a lower number than normal. Um, so the price per heifer is a little bit higher this year. Um, and we've been anywhere from 60 to, to up to this $89 per heifer on our development. So the forage um, cost us, and, and the thing is you're gonna plant, um, you know, for us the same acreage um, because we plant before we have all of our nominations in. So, um, you know, our forage cost was a little over $2,000 with um, the price per heifer being around $90 a head for the forage system. Um, so the forage costs are associated with planting, so seed cost, uh, fertility cost, if you need to lime, um, so taking a soil test and, and making sure your pH is right. Um, so uh, any type of weed treatments, uh, that all kind of compiles into your forage cost feed um, so we didn't have to uh, this this one right here is what uh, this particular line item is what will show a, a profit or a loss because if you have to add a lot of feed then that's that's where you're going to really get into your pockets as far as cost so we were able to keep our feed costs at a minimum at uh, 16 dollars a head um, then you're always going to have mineral cost um, typically for us, it ends up being about a bag of mineral per heifer um, over our um, kind of six-month um, um, development phase. Um, you're always going to have some vaccine costs and some deworming costs. For us, uh, those have been between $13 and $16 a head. Um, then the carcass ultrasound is going to run around $20. Um, breeding, we've been anywhere from $55 to $65 per heifer on our breeding cost. And that takes into account uh, all of our med uh, medicine costs, um, leasing a, a cleanup bull. Um, and then, um, so you're always, you always need to be prepared for anything else that may come up. Um, so kind of miscellaneous costs that um, you just have to kind of account for. So um, we've got our bread, now what? Uh, so <clears throat> a lot of times, we, once we get them bred, we kind of take a sigh of relief and, and, and turn them out and hope for the best. Um, but we have to remember that this is still part of her development phase. So if she's 65% of her mature body weight at breeding and we're targeting 85% of mature body weight at calving, then she still needs to stay on that steady plane of nutrition to ensure that, um, that she's maintaining a body condition that will allow her to uh, raise that calf and to her best ability. Uh, so we're looking at about um, 250 days from weaning to breeding. Uh, could be a few additional days if uh, she didn't catch on that first breeding or, or even the second breeding. So she may have some additional days uh, that she can get to that point. So with a steady plane of nutrition, most heifers can maintain a one to one and a half pound of gain a pound per day gain and be on target for that 85% of mature body weight. Um, understanding that we need to be at about a body condition score of six at calving to, because most of the time we know they're gonna probably lose about a body condition score um, after calving and, and to feed that calf. So a body condition score of six is a good target for us. Um, so what happens from that point uh, of calving to, uh, to rebreeding. Um, so that's one of the most challenging times for a, uh, for a new uh, cow or a new first calf heifer in your system. So she's not only going through her peak lactation time period, but she's also learning to be a, a, a new mother and trying to 
uh, start cycling again. So going through uterine involution and getting ready to rebreed. Uh, so this is a very challenging time that we, we need to pay close attention to. So a lot of our heifers will fall out of our program because um, at the time of calving, some folks will kick them out with the mature cows and assume that, that they're part of the cow herd now. Um, I think we do them a disservice when we do that. So uh, this is the um, nutri nutritional demand that we must not overlook so that our first calf heifers will rebreed. So their requirement um, is still around a 10% crude protein, 65% TDN um, to get to that projected 1200 pound mature weight. Um, so will your forage alone meet this nutrient demand at that time um, that you've that you're calving and into your peak lactation. So especially those that are in a fall calving system, um, if, if you're in peak lactation and rebreeding in December and January, um, what forages are available during that time? Um, so if you do have some that can be grazed, or if you're feeding hay, you need to make sure that you're testing those qualities. So um, this is some data from uh, different uh, farm groups or groups of calves from our um, heifer development program at Sand Mountain. So um, this is the weights of those heifers when they came off of our program. Um, and I wanted to show this to show that um, the average daily gain that was needed from the time that they came off of our test until calving. Some of those heifers were a little older, so they didn't really have to gain a whole lot at all, or maybe zero. Um, so from, from zero up to um, a pound, uh, or 1.35. Um, so those are very atta attainable goals uh, from, from breeding to calving. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show some real data there to show that uh, these are certainly things that we can do. So reproduction cannot be forgotten. Uh, so some of the things that we can uh, do to ensure that we're really keeping the most elite heifers in our system, um, we can do pelvic measurements. Um, you can work with your uh, local veterinarian, um, or uh, maybe you have um, someone in the in the community that um, that's a cattle producer that's familiar with this type of measurements. Um, so you can use a pelverimeter, like what's shown here in the picture, um, or um, you can kind of measure your um, the distance between uh, maybe your thumb and pinky, and upon palpation, uh, get a pretty good idea of the space um, that's in between their pelvics, their pelvis. So you're measuring. Um, the, the distance um, up uh, vertical um, as well as horizontal that's available um, with a target of 150 square centimeters. Uh, and this is a good indication of, of her ability to be able to have that first calf. So the, the cowboy math, again, you can take that number, uh, 150 divided by two, and that, that equates to the size of calf that she could have. So 150 divided by two, um, she could have a 75 pound calf uh, that was presented in normal presentation. You can also do reproductive tract scoring, um, and that's just to make sure that, that you don't have a juvenile tract um, in your heifers and to really see if they've uh, attained puberty. Um, so as you can see in this um, image below where it's a dissected repro tract, uh, you're feeling for the size of that tract as well as the size of the ovary. Um, and on that ovary, does she have any structures? Um, so does she have follicles? Um, does she have a CL present? And that kind of lets us know um, if she's been cycling. Um, so this, um, this is a good way to um, maybe call out some of those heifers that haven't reached puberty or they're not far enough along um, in, their, um, in their development. Um, you always want to think about docility, um, and here lately there's been some emphasis on feet scoring. Um, so the Angus Association has a really nice foot scoring chart um, that look angle uh, as well as the evenness of those of those claws to give you a good idea of how um, how her feet are going to hold up in your system. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the heifer development program that uh, we offer here at Sand Mountain, um, and this is for anyone in the state. Um, you can nominate your heifers for this program. Um, so we'll be accepting those nominations again in November. Uh, we receive heifers in January. We do breed them in April. For us here in Northeast Alabama, we feel like a, um, a winter calving time period or an early spring calving time period matches our forages. 
for those heifers when they're in peak lactation. Um, so then they return home in June. Um, it's a $400 a head flat rate um, for those uh, heifers that are, that are selected to go into the program. Uh, and this includes all your data collection and breeding. It's a forage based um, as long as the weather uh, holds up for us. It is done at the Sand Mountain Research Station in Crossville, and those heifers need to be born before February the 15th so that they'll be the right age when it comes to breeding.